Hello and welcome. You're watching the Business News brought to you by Blytheway. I'm Charlie Gibson. Now, there are several, as we know, very rare things in the world. Uh, gold is one of those very rare things. And arguably an even rarer one is a gold mining company that pays a dividend. There are only about 62 globally precious metals companies that pay dividends, but we have one of them in the studio today. And it's my very great pleasure to welcome the CFO, Mark Learmonth. Mark, very good morning to you, morning. and also the uh, Vice President of Corporate Development, Morris Mason, both, I should say, from Caledonia Mining. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you very much indeed for joining us this morning. Um, you had your second quarter results out very recently. Can you just talk me through them? Yeah, we put them out um, yesterday, um, and they were a very, very creditable set of results. Uh, production pretty much where we expected it to be for the, uh, for the first half. Uh, pleasingly, operating costs coming down a little bit, um, largely helped by the devaluation of the Zimbabwe dollar, but not just that. I mean, you know, quite good cost control. Um, head office costs down, um, again, a little bit, not, not by accident. You know, a lot of effort goes into to bringing those down. Um, and then at the operating profit level, we, um, we made a, an enormous foreign exchange gain of 20-odd uh, million dollars, uh, which, was, which was largely driven by technical reasons relating to the devaluation of the Zimbabwe dollar, in particular the, the restating of the uh, deferred tax liability, which typically makes most people glaze over. But, but the genuine fact is that the Bennett, the, at the moment, right now, right now, this quarter, last quarter, uh, the previous, previous quarters, we've been getting a real tangible benefit from the fact that we're spending four or five million dollars a quarter, and that expenditure is reducing our income tax liability in Zimbabwe. But we don't, we don't have any, the, the payback for that is only going to arise when we actually bring those, those assets into production in two or three years' time. And so effectively, this is a monetary asset, uh, monetary liability, and 20-odd 20, 20 million dollars now gets devalued down to two or three million dollars. So that gives rise to a very, very significant foreign exchange gain. Also, um, other things that w contributed to that were the, um, the fact that we now recognise the amount we owe to the local electricity company as a, as a local currency liability, not as they wanted a uh, US dollar liability, so there's another four or five million there. And that also flows through into helping to bring the costs down, uh, because instead of paying 12.8 US cents a kilowatt hour, uh, we're paying the same in local currency, which is now not very much at all. So the, um, the, the results, were, the results were, were very creditable. We're very pleased with them. Uh, cash generation remains very strong um, for the time being, as does, as does our capital expenditure program. But um, absolutely where we expect it to be. And, you know, we continue, as you point out, we continue to pay a quarterly dividend of just under seven, seven cents a, a quarter, 27 and a half for the year. It, it wasn't all quite plain sailing. I, w I want to come back to the, the Zimbabwe dollar in a minute, or maybe we should call it the new Zimbabwe dollar, I don't know. But uh, let's come back to that in a minute. But you reduced your guidance, your production guidance for the full year. So when I say not all plain sailing, uh, there were some trials and tribulations. Yeah, the, the reduction, the, the, <coughs> the, the production guidance came, was previously 53 to 56,000 ounces. We brought it down to 50, 53,000. We shaved 3,000 off. And actually, that doesn't reflect what happened in the first half of the year. That reflects what we expect to happen in the second half of the year. So if I'm talking narrowly about the first half, the first half, production for the first half was a few hundred ounces, less than we'd expected. The difficulty we have looking forward for the balance of the year is in the, the first six weeks of the third quarter, so six weeks really until last Friday, um, we were suffering enormous power outages at the mine. And uh, power out load shedding, which may not be a term that people in, in the UK are familiar with, but certainly coming from South Africa, load shedding is, is part of life, which just basically means the country runs out of power and they ask or, or they, they just turn, turn users off. Uh, so in the in the uh, if you're a, a residential customer in uh, in Zimbabwe, you'll have been suffering power outages of 18, I think now up to 20 hours a day. Um, they they tried to protect the the gold producers uh, for as long as they could, but pretty much from the second or third of July onwards, Blanket Mine was suffering outages of anything from eight to 10 hours a day, which means that without electricity we can't produce gold. We do have backup generators. Um, they're terribly expensive. Uh, so in July alone, we used 265,000 litres of diesel 
um, which is terribly expensive, and that's not a long-term solution. So production, notwithstanding the fact we do have standby generators, uh, production in or in July and the first part of August was badly affected by electricity. Happily, last Friday we signed a new power supply agreement um, with the with the government supplier. Is, is um, that, if I can put it, is that is that um, worth the paper it's written on? Uh, we hope so. No, we think so because the, one of the actually one of the things that, that genuinely came out of the the interactions we had with with government over the course of the last five or six weeks is government absolutely understands and the ministry of so the government the minister of mines the minister of finance and the reserve bank absolutely understand that they need the gold industry to continue to produce gold to earn the foreign exchange to keep zimbabwe afloat and having no electricity isn't doesn't isn't part of that that parcel so you say is it worth the paper it's written on we see a very clear commitment from government to get a to get a long-term solution here so happy to have that agreement in place the other uh, but you know you say is it worth the paper it's written on? We all know that the electricity supply and demand situation in sub-Saharan Africa is precarious, likely to get worse if the situation in, in, in South Africa gets worse because ESCOM is a major supplier up to, up to Zimbabwe. So in that, in that context, we're now very advanced in um, evaluating a, the first phase of a solar project, um, which would go some way towards reducing um, blankets reliance on the grid. And first phase would, would perhaps take half, perhaps provide half of what blanket needs. Second phase would be a bit more complex because we need to put in place various agreements to what to do with sort of temporary surplus peaks in power production. But very much, very much looking to see what we can do to try to uh, de-risk blanket from an electricity supply perspective. But then the other reason why, I have to go back to your initial, but the other reason why we shaved uh, production guidance is we're continuing to experience grade, grade issues. Uh, so the grade that we're getting at the mine continues to be less than planned, um, and that's largely because we are we are not developed into the higher grade areas that we expect it to be in at this stage, which also go, but goes back to electricity supply problems because when we have interruption to electricity supply, we have enough power to maintain production, but not enough power to maintain production and do development. And so typically in those, in those situations, you focus on tomorrow's production, not next week's production. Um, and so we, we took it upon ourselves to just shave back uh, production guidance a little bit, but not, no effect on earnings. Earnings guidance for the year stays as, as previously stated, so I think 84 to 117 um, uh, cents uh, a share, because notwithstanding a slightly lower production, slightly higher gold price and lower costs. So no, no real effect. Uh, if, if I can um, just extend the conversation out to the broader, if you like, environment, in Zimbabwe, you talked about the power supply problems. Now, if there's a shortage of power, I'm guessing there's a shortage of other things as well. Consumables, you talked about your diesel consumption. Is there enough fuel in, in, in the country to keep you supplied if that's what you need? Uh, can, Morris, can I come to you just ask you about the broader situation in the Zimbabwean economy? Yeah, Charlie, the, the, the most significant thing, as then you see it in our results, is the, is the currency issue. Um, you know, the, the Zim dollar. Uh, experienced a tenfold devaluation uh, in the first half of the, in the first half of this year. So, so is this back to the old days? Because we remember the old Zimbabwe dollar. That, you know, when uh, we, I we still don't have hundred so. trillion dollars of old Zimbabwe. No, so yeah, we, we don't think so. F fundamentally, the, the root causes of the inflation are different. So, if if we go back to before February this year, Zimbabwe was maintaining a currency peg and maintained that currency peg really since the old Zim dollar collapsed in two thousand and nine. The uh, the root cause of the problem is they hung on to that currency peg for far longer than they, in, than they should have. Um, and eventually that currency peg broke, uh, like all currency pegs do eventually, uh, in, in February of this year. And the devaluation then from effectively a one-to-one -one exchange rate to what at the moment is about a ten-to-one exchange rate. It seems to have stabilized at around about 10-11. Uh, we'll, we'll see. It's obviously a volatile situation. Uh, we're a gold miner and we report in dollars. So, so the, the underlying results of the business is probably a mildly positive impact in terms of the costs, as Mark mentioned. Uh, but, but I think it's important for, for investors to note that the, the underlying causes of the inflation this time, I know this time is different, is a dangerous <laughs> thing to say, and, and, and we're, so that's not lost on us. But the underlying causes of the inflation are different. They're, they're, there's no money printing. The government's not monetizing any debt. The government is running a primary budget surplus and has been doing so since, I think, uh, September, October 2018. Uh, budget surplus is $100 million uh, in, in, in recent months, per month. So, so the government are, are taking uh, the, 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 some, some bitter medicine, I think, and, and we think long term that is likely to have 
positive effects. Uh, they've raised central bank overnight lending rates to 50% per annum uh, to try and constrain bank lending, constrain bank leverage. Uh, so so, so the, the situation is fundamentally different to, to the, the monetization of debt that happened under the previous um, uh, administration uh, and, and back in the 2009 days. Uh, does, does that affect your workforce? Uh, sort of it, it, yes, it, it did. It did very dramatically when the peg was maintained. So when they were holding on to this peg, at one to one, and the rate in the street was clearly closer to five to one, uh, and we pay at the official exchange rate. Uh, that was a very, very uh, serious effect on morale, and it was difficult uh, the first uh, first few months of this year. Uh, we've effectively been able to give our workers in Zimbabwe dollars a tenfold pay increase uh, to to today from from January this year, uh, for the simple reason that we pay at the official exchange rate. But but as uh, the devaluation happened, the official exchange rate was in some cases slightly behind what was perceived to be the street rate. Again, when the situation is as volatile as this, it's difficult to, to, to get a clear view, but uh, we, we, morale in the mind certainly improved, uh, and, and rightly so. I think if, you know, if I was getting paid one-fifth of, of, of uh, my salary, I would uh, be, be justified, be unhappy. So uh, it, it's got a lot better. Uh, in the last eight months, but it was difficult in the beginning of the year. But we can't pretend the blanket is an island, okay? So whilst we've done what we can to <coughs> protect the position of our workers, you've got, to, you've got to understand that if you're not one of those lucky people who works for Blanket Mine, if you work for, say, the government, the Ministry of Mines, or and you, you, you're a regulator or the tax people, the people you need within government to do the things that have got to be done to make business work, um, it's very, very difficult for them, them to work when their own spending power has been, been reduced significantly, when they've got no power. When they, they can only, the only time they've got power at their houses is between midnight and four in the morning. And so what we have seen is a, um, a slowdown to a standstill in the sorts of regulatory processes that, that we need to get seen to be done. In particular, case in point would be this, um, this uh, transaction to buy out the 15% of Blanket Mine, that's owned by one of the indigenous partners. We need approvals from the Reserve Bank and, and, they, and the, the counterparty, they need a, um, a tax clearance. And just trying to get the administration to, to get them to do this stuff is becoming incredibly complex. So you can't, you can't pretend that's not a problem. You asked about the availability of the stuff we need. Um, pretty much everything, everything that the mine uses, we can bring up from Johannesburg and increasingly we are because uh, we did. We do try. We, we did try very aggressively to procure as much as possible locally, but if you're finding the the pricing for local products is um, is out of kilter with what we can what we can import it for from, um, from Johannesburg, we can't justify using using local local supplies. Diesel. Uh, it was it was a struggle. Um, we probably bled the system dry, I think, in the course of July. So that was not a sustainable long-term solution. Had we been continuing to use diesel for month after month after month, I think we'd have, would have found it impossible to get the amount that we needed. But we managed for the period we needed it. OK, we, we, we talked about a lot of uh, sort of complex things, shifting things, and difficult to predict. And I might quote Yogi Bear and say, forecasts are difficult to make, especially when they're about the future. The one thing I think you know we haven't talked about so far, the elephant in the room, is actually the central shaft in the ground, isn't it? Which is yeah. now complete. Very, very pleased. We're very, very pleased that in uh, July we um, announced that we've um, finished the shaft sinking process. So we started sh sinking the shaft in early 2015, and now we've got a hole in the ground that goes from surface down to just over 1.2 kilometres. So that's three times deeper than the shard is high. Um, which I think is a very useful way of looking at it. At the moment, that's just a dirty, bare hole in the ground. It's not, it's not concrete lined. So we've now started the process of uh, equipping that shaft, which means putting in um, steel work so that we can support the infrastructure that's needed to operate the, the lift systems, um, a four compartment uh, lift system. Uh, that started, and that will be finished, broadly speaking, this time next year. So sometime in the early in the third quarter of next year, I'd hope. Which then, then means that you know, we can start to, we've, we've already begun the development away from that shaft. And so that means that pretty much as soon as that shaft is, um, is equipped and operational, we can start to rack up production from these new areas, uh, which will then see production start to increase very smartly from the current levels, the 50-ish 50 50 thousand ounces a year, up towards uh, 80,000 ounces a year by 2022. And that, that is, that's on its way. It's really happening. You know, Could that happen 11... just a teeny bit earlier, do you think? Because middle of next year is still 2020. 
Middle of next year's 2020. So equipping, could 2021 be equipping, running up? No, equipping the shaft is, is, I don't want to underestimate the complexity of that. That shaft isn't concrete lined, okay? So the, the benefit is that it's cheaper to do. Mm -hmm. Concrete lining a shaft will be very expensive. The disadvantage is that now we do not have a uniform cylinder going into the ground. Um, it, it's, it, it, it sort of, in certain areas it's wider, certain areas it's narrower. And so putting in the steelwork means that you've got to fly a drone down the shaft, take measurements every five metres or so, cut the steel to that specific length, and then put the steel in that, in that specific position. And it, it, that will be an exercise, OK? But it is quite complex. I'm confident we can do it. So I don't think we can do it any more quickly. Okay, so 2020. Time, time, timing wise, 2021, yeah. you're expecting 75,000 ounces. Okay, so you're almost there. Almost yeah, there. Yeah. I mean, you know, there. And then 2022 is, is 80,000 ounces. But look on and, a quarter by quarter basis. Um, this blanket mine is, is highly, sens is highly um, volume sensitive. Okay? So as, as volume increases, as we, as we get more gold out, the fixed costs, which are quite high now, the fixed costs are about two thirds of the overall cost base. That, the, that brings your average unit cost down quite a bit. The capex falls away very smartly. And so the free cash generation just, 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 just increases. Then that's even before you start looking in the uh, factoring in the benefit of the current gold price. So we are within 12 months. We can smell the money coming. We can, we can see it coming towards us. And um, it, it's after five, five years of spending thick end of $20 million a year. Bring it on, eh? Bring it on. <laughs> All right. On that note, I'm afraid we're going to have to draw it to a close. Uh, gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that was Mark Learmont there, the CFO of Caledonia Mining, joined by his Vice President of Corporate Development, Morris Mason. As I say, that's all we've got time for. Uh, Caledonia Mining, you can go and take a look at it. You could have bought the shares a month ago for £4. You can buy them today for about £4.80. So uh, what's that? 20% uplift in the space of a month. Not bad going, as they say. Uh, as I say, I'm afraid that's all uh, we've got time for today. This is me, Charlie Gibson, signing off. We'll be bringing you more, more such uh, investment ideas in the very near future. Until then, you have a capital day.